Okay. All right. So today, you know, God gave the church a very, he's right there, I just saw him. God gave the church a very, um, a very important tool when he gave us the Bible. I'm sure you all agree, all agree with me when I say that the Bible is our all-sufficient guide to faith and daily living. It has the answer to everything that we're looking for. It is the, the manual that God's given to us. And we need to remember that, that God gave us this book to give us direction. But sometimes in our enthusiasm to make it seem real to us, we'll take a verse out of context um, and make it mean something that it doesn't really mean. Um, so scripture must be understood in its context because if you don't put it in its context, you can literally make it say anything. You can use the Bible as a, as a weapon against people to, make them, to, to, to beat them up and make them feel bad about themselves. You can use it to, to justify a, a wrong attitude you have. You can literally use the Bible for any evil thing that you want. So that's why it's important to understand it in its context. Um, does, does somebody have their Bible that they can... You want to? Uh, can you turn to St. Peter uh, 3.16? Good. Yes, please. Peter's writing here, and he's saying basically that there are some people in the church that are taking the letters that Paul wrote, and they're twisting it because they don't really understand it. It's pretty much the same thing that we've got going on tonight. I mean, not tonight, but in the world today. So we're going to look at five commonly misunderstood um, verses. The first one is, you, you hear people, and, and it's, not, it's, not that, it's not that this one really causes that much harm. It's just that it do, it's not really what the verse is talking about. Um, we hear people go to prayer and they, and they use this a lot, where two or more are gathered. And basically, it kind of gives the impression that if you're not praying with two people, God's not going to hear you. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's not the idea. In fact, that's not even what the verse is talking about. The verse has absolutely nothing to do with prayer. Um, uh, we, we see in, Ma- in Matthew uh, 28, 16 through 20, that as we go and minister, God is always with us. And we see in John 14, 13, that as we pray according to God's will, He provides for us. But in Ma- Matthew 18, 15 through 20, which is what, where this verse is taken from, uh, he's not even, Jesus isn't even just t- talking about prayer. This is what it says. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that, if, that every charge may be, may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if, the, if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whenever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything, they ask, it will, it will be done for them uh, by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Jesus is actually talking about church discipline here. When This is basically the model that, that the Bible shows us. The, two people will have a conflict. And usually this is re- resolved when they go and talk to each other. Because half the time... Honestly, the conflict that you have with that person is just a misunderstanding that will work itself out when you go and talk to them. It's not even that they're wrong. It's just, that it's just a misunderstanding. You know what I mean? Sometimes they will genuinely be wrong. And so you go in and talk to them about this, and they sometimes won't listen. So then you take other people as witnesses so that the story gets established. So this is actually what happened. Nothing's going to get taken out, taken out of, like, blown, out, blown away, you know? And then after that, you take it to the leadership. Why is this? Because when you take a problem to the leadership, the pastor and the elders, they're going to have the discernment to know if, they're, if this person's right or wrong. See what I mean? 
and, and then they'll be able to take the next step. And when the leadership joins with, with this person in taking the charge against them, then they are obviously and clearly doing something wrong. Um, so 15 is talking about going one-on-one -on -one with the person that you have the disagreement. Verse 16 is about having witnesses to confirm. Um, uh, verse 17 is about having everyone involved in the decision so that, so that it's, it's not just, you know, the sect of the church is kicking people out when they have no authority to do that. Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, honestly, I, I'm not trying to sound like super humble here, but that's about how most of the time when I when I go and do that, I, I I end up that you know I'm the one who has to go to go to the Lord and repent and say you know I'm I thought I was so righteous and I I wasn't the Job in the situation. <laughs> um, so then verse 18 talks about God will support discipline carried out by a, ch a church since it affirms His will. It is God's will that, dis that discipline is carried out in the church and that those who are causing problems are taken care of. Not, I mean, like, not like brushed under the rug. I mean that they're brought back to reconciliation. God always, always desires that they be brought back. So, um, so then verse 19 uh, as we, uh, is talking about as we seek God in judicial issues, c c civil law in the church, he will work it out. God will guide the discipline pr process. Um, and, and in verse 20, where witnesses have sufficiently done their part to bring a restoration, God supports, uh, supports the discipline uh, process. Listen to it one more time. 18, uh, verse, uh, verse uh, 20. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. When you, are seeking, when you are seeking the justification of the church in the name of the Lord, he will be there with you. See, so it's not actually talking about prayer. Why is that important to know in its context? First off, if you are ever in a position, if you ever are in a leadership position or something like that where you have to carry out discipline, God is with you. Go with, God, go with God's power because you know that he is, he is guiding the discipline process. It is his will to perfect the church. Next, um, when you go to prayer, God will still hear you if it's just you by yourself. You don't have to have two or more gathered in prayer to, for God to hear you. See? So do you see how it's important to understand it in its context? talks about something completely different. Next verse that I find a lot taken out of con context is don't judge. Um, usually used to justify improper lifestyles. You hear this from a lot of people in the world who don't want the church to tell them that what they're doing is wrong. Don't, don't, ju don't judge me. I, you can't judge me. You know and That's not really what this is talking about. We'll get there. Um, but yet we just saw that God supports discipline in the church. So is God double-minded? No. Let's go to Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 1 and going through uh, verse 6. Matthew 7, 1 through 6. And this is what it says. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, will be measured to you. Pay attention to that. We'll get right back to that. Why do you say, see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Um, or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there, is, um, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Now, this obviously is not about not judging, because if you look at the end of it, it says, look what he says right here. First take the log out of your own eye so that you can see clearly to take the speck out. It doesn't say never take the speck out. It says first work on your attitude. Now, why does he start it off, judge not that you be not judged? The imagery here that he's drawing from is actually from the Jewish marketplace, where they would have measures. When you were buying stuff, they'd have these measuring weights, and they'd measure it out. So that the coin that you were paying, it would make, it would be, it, they would be able to make sure that you were paying verbatim. They didn't have cash registers like they do nowadays. 
um, so that you knew what as you were as you were as you were handing out, you were being handed. You know, you were, it was a fair trade. And so the image he's talking about here is: don't be a judgmental, condemning person, because if you go around condemning everybody and always being harsh on everybody else, you're going to get a name for yourself, and people aren't going to treat you very nice. It's a very basic principle: treat people how you want to be treated. If you judge people harshly all the time and you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, this, you're not going to get any mercy later on from those same people because they're going to remember this person doesn't give mercy. Um, so now in verse 3, um, so hold on. So it talks about being a judgmental person. Here's also something else to notice. A speck is something that's small, that's caught in the eye, that comes out on its own, but it is irritating for while it's there. Remember that. A speck comes out on its own. So what he's talking about here is you're, you're judging someone for something that's not even that big of a deal and that's going to work itself out anyways. You know what I mean? You're hopping the gun here with judgment. You're being too quick to judge. Don't be quick to judge. That is, it's a very simple, a simple idea that he's laying. He's not saying do not judge. Do not have wisdom. And He's not saying be a brainless person here. He's saying do it with discretion. Be wise in what you do. Um, <clears throat> so, verse 3, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Uh, judge your heart. Make sure to examine yourself. Uh, the true Christian looks at himself and compares himself to Christ and says, am I, am, am, do, I have, do I have false identity to work out? See what I mean? The, 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 the growing true Christian doesn't say, look how righteous I am. He looks at himself and says, how can I be more like Christ? See, see the different mindset that Christ is kind of trying to show here. Um, so, uh, and then four, uh, verse 4 is more talking about um, cr uh, correcting him. Let me take this back out of your own eye when there's, when there's a log in your own eye. Um, so then, disciples must accept rebuke and survey themselves. If you claim to be a disciple of Christ and somebody brings, uh, brings a, a, a trespass against you, something that, that they say that you've done wrong to them, you need to listen and genuinely go to the Lord in prayer and ask yourself. It doesn't matter if you like that person or not. You need to listen with, to what they have to say because you might be blind to your own fault. I, I can guarantee you about 90% of the time that I've been reprimanded by somebody, I was wrong and I didn't know I was wrong. Even sometimes I wasn't wrong originally, and then I, because I ex uh, displayed an attitude later on, I became wrong. <laughs> so I'm just saying, when, 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 a, when, a, when, a, when, when somebody rebukes you for something, the true Christian needs to be wise and, and, and listen. Um, there's always some truth, even in, even in, in, even in many lies. Remember that. Um, so survey yourself. Uh, when believers work on themselves and refuse a judgmental, condemning attitude towards others, they see clearly with a humble attitude, and God can then use them to reach another. So we are not told to not judge. We are uh, told to judge with right attitude and not too quickly. Don't assume another's motives. Don't assume the heart behind what someone else is doing. Um, your bias, the way you understand things, could be blinding you. Um, and then, the, which brings us to this last verse, which people, I, I think, too quickly jump over. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. This is a bigger principle, because this is true in many, many occasions, but as he's talking about it here, he's talking about, do not give to dogs, what is holy? Okay, now dogs and pigs, we're talking about these dogs that he's talking about. Do dogs in the Jewish setting is not a, it's not a pet. It's more of a wild animal. Think of it like that. It's more of a, a beast. It's something that would attack you out in the wild. You know what I mean? It's not something that you actually want to make, be friends with. Uh, so do, do not give to, the, to dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs. What, is, what are your pearls in this context? What was he just talking about? He was talking about correcting someone. Don't give correction to someone who's hard-hearted, to the foolish person, because they won't listen to you. They'll turn on you and they'll attack you for it. When you try to, it, Proverbs talks about this too. Um, it talks about, you know, don't, 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 don't reprimand a foolish person because they'll turn on you. They won't listen to you. And then again, Jesus brings it right back up. 
when you give your pearls to a pig, they're going to they're gonna turn right back on you, they're, and they're going to trample over you, and you're going to be harmed by this. You know what I mean? This is why, as Christians, we need to be discerning when we go to the world and try to witness to them. We shouldn't go to them and be like, oh, you're in sin, you need to, to repent. Why? Because they're a dog, they're a pig. They're not going to listen, okay? They're going to take that, that, that correction that, that we're giving them, in, in a, we may even be giving it in the right attitude, but they're going to turn and attack us for it, okay? You need to give, give correction to those people who are actually going to listen, okay? Now, sometimes you won't know, and you'll go, and they won't listen to you, and they'll get mad at you, and, you know, well, you win some, you lose some, you know, but you've you got to have discretion and, and, and be wise about what you're doing. We as Christians can't just turn off our brains and just, you know, go stumbling out into the dark. God expects us to, to, to take care of things, uh, w w first off, with the heart of reconciliation, that we actually care for that person being reunited with God. And second, secondly, we need to do it with a very patient... Patient, calm, understanding demeanor. Don't be too quick in your words. Um, as so, there was this one thing that happened when I was back at college. <laughs> I still felt dumb for this one. An issue happened where, where they blocked the internet and you couldn't get on uh, social media sites. And if you guys know college kids, that's about the end of the world. So I, everybody was all upset, and I sent a big old nasty email to one of the IT guys, you know, this isn't right, I'm paying for this, you know, I, I really told him a part of my mind. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, the thing is, 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 is <laughs> it was an accident. The, inter the internet updated, and the automatic update blocked all the social media. They just had, had, they needed another two hours to reset it, that was it. But little did I know that the guy that I sent it to, David Bush, had cancer. I never got to tell him I was sorry. He just passed away about two months ago. See, I wasn't smart. I wasn't smart. I didn't think about what I was doing before I said it. Jesus here is, is, is encouraging wisdom. Don't be dumb. Don't be ignorant, church. Think about what you're doing before you do it. Don't just say something. Are you saying it with the right attitude? Are you saying it in the right way? And are you saying it at the right time? Sometimes pigs and dogs turn into kings. We just got to give them a little more time. You know? We're not supposed to do God's job. But we are still supposed to have discipline within the body. We're still supposed to have discernment. Don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. So, this is also why Jesus says to dust off your feet. Um, so you can uh, dust off your feet when, when a city doesn't listen to you and go to the next city. Because you'll waste your time on a city that won't listen to you when there's a city right down the way that would listen to you. You're wasting your time trying to throw your pearl to a pig when, there, when, there, when there's someone right down the way that, that's just waiting for you to listen, and your hang-up on this one part could prevent that person who would have accepted from hearing because you weren't wise. The person rejected, so move on to the person who will listen. Okay, um, so uh, the first one, the truth will set you free. You hear this all the time, all the time. Did you know that it's not actually ta talking about telling the truth? Did you guys know that? It's not talking about telling the truth. It's not. Mom knows where I'm going. Yeah, she knows where I'm going. Let, let's read the verse, and, you'll, and, and you should be able to get it from its context, okay? John chapter 8, verse 31. John chapter 8, verse 31. And this is what it says in John chapter 8, verse 31. And they begged him. Sorry. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now, a large herd. Of, am I in the right spot? No, I'm not. It is not John eight thirty one, is it? It is. It is. Okay. Let's keep going. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and they begged him not to command not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now, a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him 
to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Oh, I'm in Luke, okay. I was thinking, this, is not, this has nothing to do with the demon-possessed man. John 8.31. Sorry, here we go. Back on track. John 8.31, not Luke. <laughs> okay, so this is what it says. So Jesus said to the Jews who had <clears throat> believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved by anyone. How is it that you say you will, be, excuse me, you will become free? Verse 34. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I, um, I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. In John, uh, a little bit earlier, I believe, I think it's at the beginning of chapter 8. I don't really remember where. You can look it up. I'm, you can look it up later. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth that he's talking about is himself. That's why it confuses the Jewish people who are listening to him, because they say, we're not enslaved. What are you talking about? Anyone who, anyone who listen to what he says in, in verse uh, 20, I'm sorry, 32. No, I'm sorry, 35. Um, no, 34, actually. Everyone who commits sin, listen to this, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. So if you are a slave, then you need someone to set you free. Who will set you free? The truth. Who is the truth? Jesus is the truth. So it's not telling the truth that will set you free, although, yes, it is a good idea to tell the truth. It often gets us out of a lot of problems. But what it's talking about, this, what this verse is actually talking about, is the Son will set you free. That's what it's talking about. Verse 4. Now, this one I really hesitate to get too deeply into because, because it's true, and I don't want you to think that I'm saying that it's not true. God works all things for the good. Well, no, that's it, how people tend to use it is, right, is usually right. God does use all things to, for good for, for, the, for, for believers, not for the world, of course, obviously, for, the, for, for believers, yes. But the thing is, is oftentimes we as Christians use this verse in a way to be shallow. So, oh, oh you're, you, you're going through cancer? Oh, God works all things for good. Oh, oh, oh your, your son's not saved? Oh, God works all things for good. Instead of sitting there and weeping with them. See what I mean? Instead of being a brother to them, are we family or are we just spouting out a useless verse to them? See what I mean? Yes, it does. It tells us to mourn with those who mourn. And oftentimes all we do is quote this verse to them, which means absolutely nothing to them. Tell me, if you're going through cancer, are you going to want to hear the dead words, God works all things together for good? No, you're in pain. You want someone to stand beside you. It may be true that God works all things for good. That may be true. But that's not the point. God wants us to lift each other up, to encourage each other. And if all we do is just qu quote a verse to someone who's in pain, we're not being good servants. We're not being good servants. So i got a little more time. Um, let me make sure I hit everything I want to talk about. You know, also, another thing is, is oftentimes... We as Christians, this is a very sad thing, but sometimes we use the Bible to hide behind where people don't actually get to see us. They don't actually get to, we don't become real with people. We don't take the time to show people how we're really feeling and how we're really thinking. I, you know what, brother, I'm having, I'm having some serious doubts about my Christian walk. Can you, can you, can you help me? Can you pray for me? You know, sister, I, I was having some dirty thoughts. I was on a bad site this week. No, we don't do that, do we? We hide behind our Bible verses. You know what I mean? God doesn't desire that. God desires for us to be real with one another so that we can build each other up. You can't build someone up if they won't lower the wall. It's impossible. You cannot because they won't let you into the wall for them to lift them up. You can't do it. But if you lower your guard and you be real with someone, I've got genuine struggles and I need your real help, then you allow that person to come in and tell you where your faults are and allow them to discipline and correct you and you listen to them and you allow them to lift you back up. 
then growth will happen. Then growth will happen. You know how you, know how you cause, cause fruit to grow, to grow on a fruit tree? You got to prune it. You know what the first step of pruning is? Cutting off the dead. You got to take off the dead. Sometimes you, you, you know, trees can't prune themselves. You know that? We need someone to come alongside us. We need people to be real with. And God desires for that to be the church. So basically, yes, that is true, though. If you are, if you are in the body, God, it, it, Satan desires destruction for you. There are people out there who desire destruction for you. The, 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 remember, we are fighting principalities and powers. We're fighting the darkness. Never forget that. We're not fighting our brother. We're fighting the devil and all of his minions. Okay? But don't forget what, what the enemy is meaning for harm. God can turn for good. God can turn it for good. God can. Sometimes God has to discipline you. Sometimes he allows things to happen. But in the end, he will use it towards the good of his body. And he will use it for, the, for his glory. He will. You may not see it. Now understand this. God using something for the good is not using it in a way that you understand. Sometimes the good is something that you'd never understand on this, on this world. Sometimes you won't ever understand it. It'll just seem like a lose-lose situation to you. And then you get to heaven and you'll see, okay, God had something bigger in mind. Sometimes that's how it happens. I'm not God. You can ask him about it when you get there. The fifth verse, the fifth and final verse that I want to talk about that is often misquoted. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> boy, oh boy, oh boy. Usually this is used as an excuse to live selfishly. Usually people use this verse to say, I can do all things. I can do whatever I want. Because of Christ, you know, we got this special thing worked out. I can do it. That's not what he's talking about at all. Not about it at all. Let's turn there. Philippians 4, 10 through 14. Once you understand this in its rightful context, this is a truly powerful verse. But you must first understand that this is not a get-out-of-jail-free ticket. This is not a I-can-get-whatever-I-want-on-this-world ticket. This is not a I can claim, name it and claim it and God can just has to give it to me because His Word says so. That's not what this is about at all. Once you learn this principle, this is a principle, once you learn this, you can find contentment in the world. Philippians 4, verse 10, and this is what it says. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned, oh, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I, how, to, how to abound. And in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, going through hard times and good times. Verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Basically, what he's saying here, this is how you'll know if you're using, misusing this, this verse. Is it, are you saying is it's about what I can accomplish, or are you, are you saying it's, what, it's, what, it's about what God can guide me through? If you're saying it's about what God can guide me through, you're using it right. If you're saying it's what I can accomplish, you're using it wrong. Okay? This is not a, I'm going to get, I'm going to get, a, 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 I'm going to get a Ferrari because I can do all things. I'm going to be the top CEO in the world and everybody's going to tremble before my fist because I can do all things through Christ. No. No, I'll, for just a second. Um, um, the, the, the truth is what it's saying is no matter what we are brought through, Christ can guide us through. He's in charge. He's there. Paul's writing this from prison. Okay? he just been beaten for like, I think the, at this time, I think it was the fifth time? Fourth. Yeah, third or fifth, somewhere in there. Moral of the story, he's been, he's been beaten. He's, he's lost everything. He literally has nothing at this point. He's in prison, and he's writing a letter. It's soon to, he's soon to be beheaded, and he's writing this letter to the Philippians. And he's saying, I, I, I have had enough money to, to spare to get me by, and I, I, I've been in hunger and in need where I had nothing. And you know what? I found the secret to being content. Christ is my strength. I can be there with Christ. Go ahead, Cindy.
Yes. Because Thanks, buddy. At one point in my life, I'm taking on a leadership position. And I was like, I'm going to take a position. And 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 I'm going to take
the first, fourth verse we talked about is God works all things for the good, and that one pretty much is used correctly most of the time. That Now remember, it is towards the body. All things for the, for the good of those who believe. Those who believe, so don't forget to, not to, don't forget to include that last part of that. But pretty much people use, it, use, use that one right. Um, but just don't use Scripture as a fallback instead of being real with someone. And then fifth... Um, we talked about I can do all things through Christ and how that's actually talking about finding contentment in, in submitting to God's leadership. Um, so with that, we're done. Please join me with the word of prayer. Lord, we pray that you give us the wisdom and the uh, discernment to, t- to understand your, your word rightly and to give it the time that it, that, it, that it needs in our life so that we can be reshaped and that our mind can be renewed. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, and that we can, we can rightly apply it to our lives when we do that. Um, I, I pray that you would bless everyone who came tonight, help them to get home safely. We pray for, um, for lost family members who are in our heart, hearts so, excuse me, heavy, uh, uh, so, so heavily burdened on our hearts, Lord. Uh, we pray that you, you would open up their, open up their, their, their spiritual eyes, uh, help, their, help their ears to hear well, Lord. And um, pray that you would reach out to them and draw them in. Help us to be used as your tools. Uh, We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen.